the closure of Splash Mountain and its re-theming to Tiana's bio-adventure is one of the biggest stories to come from the theme park world in recent years, which has even leaked out of our niche community and into the mainstream. Just a quick Google search will explain why, as all major news stories are focused on the controversial subject matter that Splash Mountain draws its story from, which I'm not here to say is wrong. In all honesty, I don't think Disney's decision to utilise Song of the South as the IP to base this major attraction on ever made much sense. Even back when the attraction first opened, Disney made sure spokespeople were clear that the attraction would focus solely on Song of the South's animated scenes and would avoid any references to the Reconstruction Era South. But having to justify this displays the strangeness of their choice to me. Why not just go with something uncontroversial? If you had to pick and choose what you can and can't put in an attraction, maybe this wasn't a film which should receive an e-ticket attraction. This doesn't feel like a hard argument to make. But looking at just how good of an attraction the Imagineers were able to create from those animated scenes, maybe it is easy to see why they decided it was worth cherry-picking to create such a good attraction, fit with a catchy tune and cute critters. But still, I've always believed that this amazing attraction deserved better. So the question I want to explore is, will the attraction be better when it reopens as Tiana's bio-adventure? Splash Mountain was an early signal in Disney's changing approach to theme park design. It was one of the earlier examples of a major attraction being based on an IP, rather than an original story. When Disneyland first opened, the majority of attractions were based on original ideas. The only land that really utilised IP was Fantasyland. Back then, Disney had a much smaller pool of films to draw from, most of which were animated fairy tales, so the dominance of IP in Fantasyland made sense. As time has gone on, Disney has produced and obtained a much larger and more varied catalogue of films, so it's unsurprising that IP-based attractions have become the norm in most lands within Disney parks. Like most Disney park fans, I'm not obsessed with this change, and do long to see some fresh original idea attractions, but sadly, this just doesn't seem likely. In the 1980s, Disney's catalogue of films was still pretty limited, so trying to find an IP which would fit into Bear Country, resonate with audiences, and could also reuse the audio animatronic figures from America Sings whilst fitting a log flume style attraction was near impossible. Therefore, it does make sense that Imagineers settled to make it work using the animated scenes from Song of the South. Beyond just the cherry picking and the controversy, Something I always found strange was Disney's insistence on utilising an IP here. It's certainly odd that such an early, game-changing IP-based attraction would pick an IP that most people don't really know. To most, Splash Mountain has always stood apart from the film. This isn't surprising, as Disney have been keen on making the film largely unavailable, not ever releasing it officially on DVD or Blu-ray. Therefore, for most, Br'er Rabbit wasn't someone they knew from the screen, like Pinocchio or Peter Pan, but instead he was an animatronic rabbit who accompanied them on their log ride. Nevertheless, just because most haven't always made the associations to the controversial film, it doesn't take away from the fact that its origins stem from there. Thus, I do wonder why Disney didn't just take the original idea route, as for many, Splash Mountain has always seemed like one anyway. As someone who grew up visiting Disney, Splash Mountain was always a must-ride attraction for me. I loved its catchy song and cute characters, but had no idea that they came from a film. It wasn't until I got a little older that I discovered the truth. I know this attraction feels like a classic to many, myself included, but ultimately, Disney are taking an attraction based on an obscure and controversial film and changing it to one based on an incredibly successful modern film. From that point of view, there seems very little controversy. 
In spite of the fact that I understand that many will miss the original version of this ride, opting for Princess and the Frog feels very classic for Disney, going back more to their Fantasyland dark ride roots, rather than their modern preoccupation with Star Wars and Marvel. In my opinion, their most recent Disney Princess attractions are very good. The Seven Dwarfs Mine Train, Ariel's Undersea Adventure, and even Frozen Ever After all feel like they are modern continuations of the Fantasyland Dark Ride legacy, although they are of course not all located here. These attractions will pretty much retell the stories from the films they are based on through the new medium of a theme park attraction. They give us a new way to enjoy the stories we already know and love. Unfortunately, Disney has recently decided to move away from this. Instead, they seem to like to overcomplicate things and believe that just retelling the film's story isn't enough. Instead, it has to be a spin-off or a sequel story. Just look at Galaxy's Edge and Avengers Campus. Like these projects, Tiana's Bayou Adventure is taking the sequel route, concocting an all new story to base the attraction around. So will this be a good decision or a terrible one? One of the biggest problems with not following the film's storyline is that you miss out on a lot of the nostalgia for the original. Iconic scenes, songs, places, and even characters will have to be noticeably absent for the attraction. In the case of The Princess and the Frog, the likely absent ingredient will be Dr. Facilier, the iconic villain who adds so much to the movie. I'm sure Disney will be dropping references to him and maybe we will even contact him from on the other side. But who knows? Maybe we will not see Dr. Facilia at all. Of course, all of this is just speculation, and whatever decision they have made doesn't take away from the fact that the choice to devise a brand new story risks not giving the audience what they want to see. Disney seems to be making things harder for themselves by using IP to create IP-based original stories, by doing this, they lose the benefits of a story that is already guaranteed to be loved and also the full creative potential of concocting an original idea. If they want to create something fresh, why not just do something wholly original? I know that with a film, there is already a guaranteed level of investment from guests who will already feel a connection to these characters, but is this really necessary to get people to ride a new e-ticket theme park attraction? Personally, I don't think so, and there are many examples out there to support my stance, such as Space Mountain, Expedition Everest, and Spaceship Earth. But do you know what recognisable characters are good for? Merchandise sales. Now, if you're watching this video, you're probably the sort of person who would prefer obscure theme park exclusive characters on your merchandise. I know I would, but for the general guest, Familiar faces are a far easier sell, and it takes a long time for a brand new character to obtain this kind of status. But a Disney princess, well, she's already there. Even the attraction's storyline seems set up perfectly for lines of merchandise. The story, which takes up right after the film, is that Tiana has purchased and transformed a salt mine into a thriving business called Tiana's Foods, and wants to throw a party during Mardi Gras to thank everyone who made the business a success. But things go wrong when they realise that there is a missing ingredient. In all honesty, this sounds like a pretty convoluted and not a very magical storyline. One thing Disney seems particularly keen on mentioning is that Tiana's business is an employee-owned cooperative with its own line of hot sauces through which she is inspiring other women to run successful businesses as the brand grows nationwide. The co-op is a bizarrely specific thing to emphasise, and if I'm being honest, seems like something they want to use as part of their tie-in merchandise. This feels shockingly tone deaf from a huge corporation like Disney, who in using this idea would be posing as a small black female-owned co-op to sell merchandise manufactured who knows where, by who knows who, under who knows what kind of conditions. 
The small business aspect may be the biggest fantasy of all within this attraction, but maybe I'm just being cynical and Disney simply wants to provide some good representation, who knows. Anyways, putting Disney's publicity games aside, what is most important is that the attraction, storyline and all, is good enough that fans don't wish to have simply experienced the familiar tale, or even worse, Splash Mountain. It has to engage us in a way which may not have been possible by just retelling the film's story, which admittedly can risk making guests feel like passive observers rather than active participants, as they already know how it all works out without their presence. However, there can be a major problem with an overly elaborate backstory, which is that it risks guests not feeling connected to the attraction. If people have to put in too much work into understanding the storyline, they're not going to do it. Disney are incredibly good at what they do, so I don't think there will be too much of a risk of this happening. And I'm sure that the missing ingredient will be something more exciting than, say, salt and pepper. The story will probably be spoon-fed to us, with little details also present for super engaged fans to discover with each re-ride. This is backstory at its best, something which provides an enhanced experience for those who want it, but not something that is necessary to explain what we should be able to see. Ultimately, what matters more than the backstory is the quality of the attraction itself. At the last D23 Expo, it seemed like all we would be getting was some fancy fog and lasers, which no matter how they tried to sell it, didn't seem that different from what I've seen at concerts before. Thankfully, as we have since learned more, things are looking a lot better for the quality of the attraction. From Beignet Smiles in the Queue, an all new musical arrangement by Terence Blanchard, a brand new song by New Orleans native PJ Morton, 17 new audio animatronics, including music playing critters, there's certainly lots to be excited about. Disney is also emphasising the amount of research they have done for this attraction, something which has typically helped set the company ahead of its competitors. Hopefully, the accuracy to New Orleans will help bring a layer of authenticity to this attraction, which will help immerse guests. Ultimately, this attraction seems like a great fit for Disneyland, thanks to its proximity to New Orleans Square but it may be a harder fit within Walt Disney World's Frontierland. But hopefully, they have some solid plans to make it work. I could continue to criticise the attraction's lengthy name, the loss of a Disney mountain, and the budget cuts that seem to be present. But until the attraction opens, there's not much I feel I can really say on all this. Attraction names often don't feel snappy until we get used to them. There are still plenty of Disney mountains left, and the budget discussion is all just speculation. Although, looking at Disney's current financial situation, cuts wouldn't be a huge surprise. In fact, perhaps a better thing to bring up is Disney's preoccupation with their money-losing streaming service. It didn't come as much of a surprise to me to find out that Princess Tiana will be getting a Disney Plus series set to debut in 2024. Maybe this attraction is secondary to that and meant merely to market it. Okay, yes, it makes more sense for it to be the other way around. But still, I'm sure we can all relate to the feeling that everything but Disney Plus seems like an afterthought to the company right now. Well, everything but another thing that ends in Plus, Genie Plus. This brings me nicely on to my final point. Like many others, I'm not a huge fan of Disney's paid Fastpass service. I miss the days of free Fastpasses, but unfortunately don't see them coming back anytime soon, if ever. Genie Plus just seems too good at making money for Disney to ever move away from this model. Before this video turns into a Genie Plus rant, I do want to point out that there is something good which may come out of this new system. Thanks to Genie Plus, Disney gets a brand new, direct source of income each time they build a new e-ticket attraction. Thus, this may encourage them to build a bit quicker. It also may encourage them to change and update things more regularly. This transformation of Splash Mountain 
is far cheaper than building an all new attraction, but I very much foresee them charging for this attraction individually on Genie Plus. It's also a way to work around the space constraint, which is particularly present at Disneyland. Although even at Walt Disney World, where space isn't a problem, we have typically had to lose to gain. Adding or changing IP to make a pre-existing attraction a new one may not end with Tiana's Bayou Adventure. I know change hurts, but improvement doesn't. Although it may sound a little scary, this new way could be a very exciting thing for Disney Park fans. Ultimately, I'm very excited and a little nervous to experience Tiana's Bayou Adventure when it opens. What about you? Let me know what you think in the comments. Thank you so much for watching. Please give this video a like, subscribe to my channel, and check out some of my other videos. My social media channels and website are all linked in the description. See you in the bayou!